Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Digital Rebar Provision, uh, meetup number 24. Today we have some really fun stuff. Uh, at least we think it's fun stuff here at RackN. Maybe boring and put some of you to sleep, but in the world of provisioning, we think there's some amazing and some fun stuff. Uh, today on uh, the RackN team. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we've got Rob Hersfeld. Greg, are you yeah. fit? My parenthetical, we're attacking people's coffee breaks. Sorry, bad jokes. Uh, Claire? Back to you. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Uh, today from the Rack End team, we've got a, a passel of uh, <laughs> interruptees. Uh, we've got Rob Hirschfeld online, Victor Lowther, and uh, Greg uh, Her is all Greg Althaus is lurking in the background, I imagine, there in the office. Uh, today we've got some fun things. Uh, we've got a couple of Kubernetes uh, components to show. Uh, today Rob is going to show us uh, the Sono Buoy, Sono Buoy uh, stuff and Helm charts that he's built into the crib patterning. And then I'm going to do a demo on crib operational patterns, which I've been working on in the past. Uh, some of those operational patterns will be uh, drain, delete, uncordon, uh, upgrade a node and re-add nodes or add new nodes into the cluster. So very interesting, uh, I think, operational use patterns. Uh, and then Victor is going to show us some really cool candy. He's going to show us uh, no reboot provisioning patterns using kexec to boot into Sledgehammer, deploy, and then uh, do kexec magic to not need to reboot into the install OS. Saves a lot of provisioning time. Uh, very excited about seeing that as well. Uh, kicking off uh, today, we're going to have Rob show the Sonobui and Helm chart stuff. So Rob, if you're ready to take it away, I will give you the share. Awesome. There we go. Make it a little bigger. Trying to. Uh, so I have a, there's, there's two things that got added into crib off of my desk. Um, one of which was being able to install Helm charts. Uh, so there's now a stage that does Helm chart edition and a stage that does Sonoboy. Sonoboy is a Heptio project that wraps the Kubernetes conformance tests. Um, the tests take like 90 minutes to run. So we'll, I'll explain how, how that goes. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want to make it a blocking operation. Um, I have a basically a standard uh, crib cluster set up. If I want to install um, Helm charts, all I have to do is there is now a, sorry, uh, let's see, a Helm charts array option. And I can just add in whatever ones I want, stable slash MySQL. That's a good example. There's a long list of them. And I just need a comma separated list of, of what I'm going to have um, included. When I save that, what will happen is when uh, my cluster goes in and hits the Helm chart stage, it will install Helm, which also installs Tiller in the back end. It'll set a service role uh, for that environment, and then it'll run a Helm install, whatever chart you have listed. And if you run the stage multiple times, it will it's idempotent, so it'll keep running. It'll identify the tillers installed, skip that step, and then keep moving. So my uh, workflow here, not this one, the, the one I'm going to move to, this discover, um, sorry, this uh, fast cluster workflow. I need to include Helm in it. Let me put it this start. Um, so the stage that installs Helm is the Helm stage. The Sonoboy stage is the Sonoboy stage. These aren't surprising uh, names, but I'm going to go ahead and let the system uh, install the cluster with those two changes. Uh, no additional work is needed um, by default. There are some settings, of course, that you can run. So I'm going to go ahead and build my cluster. Uh, and it'll it'll run through, do the Kubernetes install, install, 
run install Helm, and then it'll run the Son of Boy install. Son of Boy does require, or actually no, there's another change I made um, to the cluster here, uh, to the main Kubernetes change that it's worth mentioning. When uh, you install, uh, run the Kubernetes uh, config stage, crypt config stage, it will pick up inventory settings and label settings. So uh, the other the other change of note here is that if you have a system that has run the uh, digital rebar inventory stage and created inventory data, this list uh, will get converted into labels automatically in your cluster. That was the other other minor change I made. Then you can influence uh, things. Uh, Son of Boy needed labels, so I added I added I decided to pull in the inventory system as part of labels. If you don't have it, it'll just label your cluster as a dev cluster or whatever you set in at the label, and then it'll it'll move on. But this is super handy. So if you wanted to find machines based on criteria you defined in inventory, uh, it would do that for you. Uh, and so we're just at a point where it's running through the, the system doing its normal configuration. Um, the thing to note about the, the Helm, oh, the Helm uh, chart configuration is it actually only runs on the master. So if you run it on any other machines, sorry, the leader, which is now different than the master, Shane can explain that, um, it will, um, it'll just skip that stage. So you, you have to at least include the server that was elected leader in the automation process. And it's just gonna go ahead and, and run it and do those things, you can take my word for it. Um, it'll come up in a, in a little bit. Sonoboy um, itself basically runs this long series of tests. Um, and to get the tests, you either need to have Sonoboy running locally and attach to the cluster to, to get the tests, or you can run Sonoboy multiple times on the cluster uh, to retrieve the results. So the system will use um, administrative credentials and upload them, upload the results. I have a couple of past versions where I went into files and it'll literally, um, when the result is finished, it will detect that and um, upload the results with base stamps into your files endpoint. And there is a setting in Sonoboy that says wait for my results and you can determine how many minutes you want it to wait. Um, the benefit here is that those results will let you validate that your cluster is conformant as per the community specs. Um, I, could, I could keep talking about it, but those are, those are the critical details. Um, and it's just going through and installing it on the cluster, right? The master, master comes up more slowly. And then if, if it wasn't um, clear, um, this is what Shane was asking about before we start recording, which is um, this kube cuddle. You can click here and it'll, uh, it, it'll download the admin comp file for you uh, out of the profile. Cool. Shane, I could keep, I could, you know, it's, it's just going to run and do its thing. So um, that's awesome, but can you back up just a tiny bit and just explain a little bit uh, for those of us uh, not familiar with Kubernetes, specifically yeah. what Sonobui is doing, what Helm charts are doing. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, so, you, you kind of jumped over those fun parts. <laughs> I assume everybody knows. It's like required <laughs> reading. Um, so so um, I'll, I'll say Kubernetes is required reading if you're not familiar with it. Um, Helm is basically a package manager for Kubernetes. So there's a um, let's see if I can find it easily. So there's a, uh, for the Helm, uh, let's see again. So basically what people do is they create applications about, uh, you know, for it to install in Kubernetes, and then they write um, a Helm chart, which allows you to install Kubernetes in the cluster. And so there's a, a long, long list of applications that people have written a Helm chart for, that if you run that chart, it will install that application for you in the cluster. Um, and what, what this, what, what the addition to crib lets you do is you can specify, well, all you have to do is specify the, the stable lamp and it will pull in um, whatever components are necessary in the Helm chart. 
Um, it'll go to the, it literally goes to this library, pulls it down, internet connectivity is required, pulls down all the containers and, and everything else. Um, Sona Boy, uh, which I have, there's a GitHub for that too, um, allows you to conformance test. Uh, it's out of Heptio. And so what this does is it runs, I, we don't install the UX, we just use the CLI, but it literally is a client, a Goline client that runs and runs the conformance tests. So conformance tests are API tests to tell you if the Kubernetes cluster that has just been installed matches the required features for the community based on version. And so that's, this is just running those results for you. The thing that's really, really handy with the Sonoboy piece is that if you add it into your cluster bring up, which we have not yet done by default, it will start the conformance process in the background and you can just check back in an hour or 90 minutes and get retrieve the results to see if you're, you're you passed conformance. Um, it can be really, really handy if you're doing an upgrade or making changes or you're trying to make sure that you've, you've built in a conformant cluster. Nice little touch. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Rob. Appreciate that. Uh, any more to add on that or any questions? Oh, we got um, Chris, sort of an SLA check for Kubernetes. So Chris's question is, is Sonobui sort of a service level agreement check for Kubernetes? Right. Um, so, so the the idea would be if you go to the the Kubernetes certified list, you're going to see a whole bunch of companies that have certified Kubernetes uh, installs. This is basically saying Crib could become a certified Kubernetes install using these things. Um, it's not an active monitoring thing. It's really an, an API test at this point. So it's it's not yeah. a security check or. Anything it like verifies that. And, and validates the API conformance to a given set standard so that you can say check mark everything behaves the way we expect a Kubernetes cluster to behave as you built it. And, and it, the, the, the content pack itself follows a really useful pattern. Um, so you can basically pick up the same type of behavior and you can start adding other clusters, cluster level operations element and, and it's basically Helm is very similar. I wish they'd done it as a Helm chart, but then I wouldn't have to do any work. Exactly. Okay, so uh, any other questions of liability control? Yeah, yes. exactly. A mechanism for governance of verifying Kubernetes behaves the way it is. So if you have a Kubernetes application that runs on one cluster, you would hope it runs on another Kubernetes built cluster from another provider. And that's the, very much the goal behind Sonobui in some respects is to validate and verify the appropriate APIs that are expected to be there are indeed there and it meets that conformance level. So yeah, if, if Rackn uh, started having a certified Kubernetes product, this would be the first step. Exactly. Okay, if there are no further questions, <laughs> Look, no humans. <laughs> yes, automation. Automation is the name of the game. Uh, so if there are no further questions or comments from the peanut gallery out there, uh, Rob, if you want to uh, pass the puck to me, I will share and we'll move on. All right, so let's do share. So I'm going to talk about today uh, Kubernetes operational patterns. So building Kubernetes clusters is great. That's all fun and exciting stuff. Uh, but also being able to operate and run them in the real world is important. Um, one of the things that we can do with digital rebar provision is provide workflows that do just about anything you can imagine uh, through a stepwise process on machines. And we've been exploring a lot of that uh, opportunity as we go from just putting an OS onto a machine to adding application stuff. And Crib is an example of that where we deploy and configure Kubernetes clusters. But then you have day two operations, how you operate and run things with the tool that you built to uh, deploy and manage the cluster. Now there's a certain amount of um, sort of restraint you have to or develop in terms of what tools do you use for what things. So for example, in Kubernetes, we have the process of the operating installation and we do the Kubernetes install with kubeatom patterns. 
but we're driving that through digital rebar provision workflows, which has its own sort of um, highly uh, opinionated way of doing things. Now we try and build things to give you flexibility and control, but at some point in some stage, we develop a concept of, or, or an opinion of how we're gonna deploy things and how much control we give you. As our crib content matures, we give you more and more control and configuration, but also ultimately you have to be able to manage the clusters that are handed off. Now there are a lot of tools to do that. And what I mean by the restraint statement is you have things like kubectl. So kubectl does a lot of things. So the question is, uh, ultimately our workflows in the background are driving for the most part kubectl commands when you talk about operational patterns. So the question is, how much do you bake into workflows that drive kubectl, which is front-ending a CLI to an API, versus uh, just giving you the cluster and saying, go do your thing with kubectl. So there's a, a real balance point there. Some of the operational patterns that uh, we've been thinking about that do make sense, we think, to bubble up into uh, the crib content are things like uh, removing machines from the cluster, being able to upgrade those machines, uh, put a new version of Kubernetes on there, and bring those machines back into the cluster so you can uh, manage and maintain your cluster continuously through a workflow aspect. Now, this is where we're going to look at some of those patterns that uh, we've built in there, and some of these patterns will certainly uh, morph and change and grow over time. Uh, and we're curious to get feedback from those of you using Kubernetes in the field and digital rebar provision in the field, uh, what, it, what things you like, what you missed, what you'd look forward to. Um, and that's where some of these patterns came from, from some of our real, real world customers in the field using digital rebar provision to deploy crib cl Kubernetes clusters and operational patterns they needed to accomplish and then we wanted to drive through uh, workflow. So to do that today, I have a cluster. It's actually running in Amsterdam right now in the packet.net environment. Uh, and this cluster is currently running with Kubernetes crib. Uh, we're running with the tip content version of Kubernetes. So our current tip content uh, has a number of enhancements and features. Um, uh, even though it says unspecified, it's actually built on tip. Uh, and if we look at our cluster, um, we have the cluster built through our standard mechanism, which gives us our admin.conf. And if we look at uh, our cluster specification, we see we've got four machines in it. And uh, we have the cluster master as crib three, uh, which is the, the cluster master and leader. Uh, back to Rob's uh, comment about master and leader, uh, we now support uh, highly available clusters and multi-master configurations. But even in a multi-master configuration, we still have the concept of a leader of those masters, uh, which allows us to be able to execute uh, specific workflows that need to be run once. So we identify that leader uh, of the HA master uh, quorum and then execute those run once uh, patterns. And the example given was uh, Sonobui and Helm are run once sort of patterns. Um, in this cluster, I have two spare machines, which are not actually in the cluster. They've been prepped. Uh, the crib machine prep workflow here just does the pre-install stuff uh, to mount the disks, install Docker, and install Kubernetes. Uh, since these processes can take a bit of time, it's a little longer to demo. And so I split the crib live cluster workflow in half. Uh, the second half of the crib live workflow is the machine add. And the machine add runs the second half, which is configure etcd, crib config, crib helm, crib live wait. And so these are basically the standard join patterns through kubeatom that will be executed uh, as workers are brought into the cluster. Uh, in addition to, uh, I should go back to workflows. In addition to that, we have a number of these example uh, workflows which provide our operational patterns. So we have uh, crib operate cordon. So this just operates and cordons a machine off from the Kubernetes cluster. A cordon operation just stops sending work to it. No other uh, app operation, but Kubernetes will no longer schedule work to a machine that's been cordoned. Uh, the second step in a cordon operation is drain. Drain actually moves containers off of a machine. If the machine hasn't been cordoned yet, it'll also cordon it. So you can do a single drain operation, which will cordon the machine, drain the machine. 
Uh, and then there's the delete pattern, which executes a delete of the machine and removes it, completely removes it from the Kubernetes cluster. And then last, there is uncordon operation, which brings a machine that has previously been cordoned or drained and brings it back into the cluster. And so we'll demonstrate those patterns in conjunction with adding some cluster members, uh, some workers to the uh, cluster. So for example, if we have uh, machine 04 here is currently in the cluster and we see that it's ready and in the cluster and it's ready to take workload, we want to, uh, let's start with just the cordon operation. So if we just operate cordon on the machine, <clears throat> excuse me, and we see our crib operate pattern runs here and ultimately, we, we do some statusing in the uh, logging, in the job logs. So you see the machines that are in the, the cluster in their state, and their state changes. So we actually see here, uh, machine four gets set. It's ready, so it's still ready and running, but its scheduling is disabled. And if we go back to our coop cuddle pattern, we take a look at it again, we'll see our status has changed here as well. Uh, if we go back to our machine, we want to uh, drain the machine now. We don't actually have any workload on this. I didn't throw any example workloads on there. Uh, so you'll have to take my word for that. But this operation does work if you have a um, uh, workload running on the machine. We drain the machine. We'll see again in the same set of output. We see our sort of status information and then we see our um, change in status. Although a cordon and a drain operation uh, doesn't actually change status. Um, I have to look at that specifically, but I think it, it doesn't actually change the ready status of that. And then... Uh, yeah, that's right. Just yeah, moving the so, workload off of a machine, you're not, you're not changing its status. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, in this case, uh, we have the machine has now been cordoned and drained, and it's no longer in the cluster. If we wanted to bring it back into the cluster, we'd simply uncordon the machine uh, run the workflow on it, and we'll see, uh, again, the machine was scheduling disabled, and now we see that it's switched to uh, ready. Uh, in this case, we go back to our coop cuddle pattern again, we see the, ma the machine is back in the cluster. So that's a very quick operation of uh, separating or fencing off a machine so you can do something with it. But let's do something uh, a little bit more interesting. Let's um, I'm going to simulate the pattern simply because the install process takes so long and we don't want to wait on it. But the pattern would basically be we've cordoned and drained the machine and we've got a new machine which has not been a part of the cluster and we want to add that into the cluster. So the machine has been pulled out of the cluster and we want to finish the uh, add operation to bring the machine into the cluster. And in this final process, we'll use the kubeatom join pattern with the kubeatom tokens to uh, prep the machine and add it into the cluster. So once this is done, we should see uh, machine five added into the cluster and it runs uh, pretty fast. So uh, let's see if I, I didn't catch the right one, but well, it's done already. So if we now take a look at our pattern, we'll see that machine five is in the cluster. Uh, Kubernetes gives the cluster some time to settle as it readies the machine and uh, make sure that it's valid and safe and running successfully. I believe that pattern takes about 60 seconds on this uh, uh, cluster. So ultimately we should see it, um, if I'm not lying, it should somewhere soon turn to ready if the demo gods are with me. Um, we see that it's been added, there we go. So a little over a minute this time to add the machine into the cluster. So this shows you the oper uh, sort of operational pattern of being able to separate a machine out uh, from the, the cluster. You can run a workflow to install the machine. So presumably that workflow could be an upgrade uh, version of the Kubernetes uh, software on it and then bring the machine back into the cluster. And so ultimately that pattern uh, operate, uh, works successfully just both for both adding new machines and coordinating a machine off, reprovisioning a machine and bringing that machine back into the cluster. So that is sort of it in a nutshell on what I had uh, for operational patterns there. Uh, any questions, thoughts, comments on that? Well, I think that's awesome. I would, the one thing I would note is that the stages you're showing could be sequenced into a workflow 
by themselves. And so you could you could sort of stitch these stages into a sequence. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very good point. The um, like I was saying, the workflows are uh, demonstration workflows of the individual operations, but each of the uh, work workflows are driving a single stage. So you can, like Rob was saying, you can come in here uh, and take a look at all the crib uh, patterns here, and these can be stitched into specific work operational workflows for your environment that works for you. Also, in addition to adding any any specific other workflows into the mix where you might be touching uh, some of your other infrastructure services, you know, IAM or uh, asset management or ticketing systems or monitoring systems where you might want to uh, affect your external infrastructure through some of your workflow patterns. So awesome. So Chris gives us a thumbs up. So uh, looks good and active operation stuff. Ex exactly. <laughs> awesome. Uh, any other questions or thoughts on that? And if not, we will pass the puck over to Victor. Uh, so, all right, Victor, are you ready to roll to show us some really cool uh, non-reboot provisioning? As soon as you stop sharing, there we go. There we go, share. Sound okay for Victor? Sound is fine for me. I mean, Shane, can you hear Victor all right? Yeah, it's a little in the background, but. Okay. <laughs> all right. So what I'm gonna show y'all is a demo of, uh, hopefully the demo got a smile on you. Um, provisioning four VMs onto four different operating systems using KXEC instead of Reboot. So to start with, I've got four virtual machines. You can see them uh, running over here on the uh, left side of my screen. And uh, they're already set up and discovered, so I'm gonna start uh, running them through things. So you are going to set seven. And you can see this VM has already started booting. You can tell by the corrupted console that's using a uh, uh, KXX. We are going to you are going to be a virtual agent for If you're paying attention to uh, the VMs as they booted, you may have noticed that uh, at no point did they go into the BIOS or uh, you know, the VM itself didn't power cycle. It just came exactly straight from Sledgehammer into the OS install environment. And so now- so the, first, the first K exec pattern there was going straight from uh, Sledgehammer to the Ubuntu installer. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing to- yeah, yeah, and so the way this uh, works is the, the agent on the machine knows how to find information about, uh, about boot environments that can be k-exec into. Um, if the machine is running Linux and the boot environment you want to go to uh, provides a template named k-exec that uh, specifies the kernel uh, in NRD and uh, command line to load, then the runner will try to uh, k-exec into the new boot environment instead of uh, just rebooting the system. Um, and for a lot of things, this is a heck of a lot faster than doing a reboot. Um, there is another pattern that the runner also implements that I'm not going to demo here. Um, and that is that a task, whenever it wants to um, switch boot environments, can stage its own kernel and NRD and command line and then uh, at some point down the, down the line, whenever the system, whenever the runner decides to reboot the system, uh, it will detect that there is a staged kernel uh, available to k-exec and it'll try to k-exec into that new kernel instead of uh, just rebooting the system. And so you don't really see the, uh, you don't really see how much faster it makes things whenever, because I'm just dealing with VMs 
But uh, when dealing with hardware, this can shave uh, you know tens of minutes off of an install cycle just due to not rebooting so many times. Still takes a long time to do a net boot, or it's not a net boot anymore. It's just an OS install. Yeah, OS install process still takes a bit of time because I'm not set up for doing imaging on this box, and imaging isn't set up to do get exact right now. So that's that's on the roadmap is to be able to do an image based K exact, so you would be able to transfer an image using our image tools, and then. Uh, K exact into the newly laid down image, which would be light and fast. Um, and on VMs, the, sa the time savings isn't, right, there's not that much boot time. On physical gear, reboot cycles can be three to five minutes or longer sometimes, depending on the settings. You need. Usually much longer if it's HPE or IBM gear, <laughs> yeah. IBM or Lenovo. Yeah, so pretty much the whole, uh, the goal of this is to be able to cut the amount of uh, time it takes to go through a provisioning cycle down to the minimum we can reasonably get it to. Um, and so CentOS 6 is finished installing and it did a normal reboot because CentOS 6 doesn't know how to k-exec uh, from the uh, install environment into the final environment. Oh, oh uh Florent is saying he's got some HPE gear that takes 10 to 15 minutes to reboot. I'm thinking Florent is going to love this stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so this CentOS 6 guy is finished. And I don't want it to be CentOS 6 anymore. So I'm just going to boot it back into my sledgehammer image. Did I run that one? No, it didn't run. Ah. And so the demo gods hate me there. So no, that's fine. It's just waiting. Looks like it did it. No, it didn't. Um, so somebody picked up the tasks. The, yeah, the tasks just ran through. Yeah, so there's a bug. Yay. That K-exec did not go, though. I promise, because it still says CentOS 6.9 on the <laughs> Okay, let's wait for. So I was mentioning in chat that this is very fresh off the presses. So here we are seeing some of the freshness and the, and the sharp edges we're working yeah, on. Probably didn't get my CentOS 6 support quite right. Yeah, and, and one of the things to note about this is this is a process that's going to be potentially sensitive to disk layouts and other other vagaries of system system architecture and hardware. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's definitely one of the patterns that you need to test on your hardware to make sure it does the right things for you because there are a bazillion combinations where you can get tripped up specifically with some hardware that doesn't su support the K-exec patterns and some kernels that okay. misbehave and how things can get wedged. So let's see if Ubuntu or 16.04 will uh, K-exec back in the selection of properly. No, it didn't. Okay. The idea is, is, it, is it from a standard Linux, you'd be able to jump straight back to Sledgehammer without a reboot. And does that drag Sledgehammer across the network in the process? Yes, it drags part of Sledgehammer across the network in the process. Okay. All right, so let's see what happens when we do CentOS 7. Yep, so CentOS 7 just uh, k-exec straight back into the uh, back of the sledgehammer. You can tell because uh, the console will be corrupt until the new kernel loads the right frame buffer drivers. <laughs> there we go. All right, now let's try the last one, which is Ubuntu 18.04. Okay, and then you can k properly. Okay, so I still have some debugging to do, apparently. 
but there is, uh, so at least on CentOS 7, we can do a complete uh, lifecycle management, including uh, going through provisioning and some deprovisioning without ever actually having to reboot the box. And that's it for my demo. Any questions? Oh, lots of stuff in the chat. Oh my. Uh, so yes, this isn't the latest tip. Um, as of uh, yesterday evening. Um, so okay, exact guide. Stick to CentOS seven until I do some debugging on uh, these other on these other operating systems. Make sure I'm uh, setting up KExec properly um, in their environment. Uh, and I am setting it up so that uh, KExec will do its best to go through the uh, distro provided uh, mechanism for cleanly shutting down before actually switching to the new running kernel. So it'll try to safely unmount file systems and do the normal shutdown routine. It's just that instead of, uh, you know, talking to firmware to reboot the box, it will instead uh, just KExec into a new kernel. All right. <laughs> we got a, a, um, a pithy peanut gallery today. Yeah. Flor Florence says, no further questions, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> OK, excellent. Uh, that's a wrap on uh, what we have to show today. So in sum, we've got uh, Rob showed us the Sono Bluey and Helm charts capabilities. I showed the operational patterns to cordon, drain, delete, uncordon, uh, and add uh, uh, machines back into Kubernetes clusters. And then we got to see exciting k-exec features as well from Victor. Um, any other questions or thoughts on what we talked about today in um, demo and presentation from folks? Or do we want to cut over to our Community questions and wrap up. Okay, awesome. I think uh, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, Florence says he's looking forward to Kubernetes one day. He's not not ready for it yet. Not interested in it yet, but one day it looks good. So thank you, Florence. Uh, with that said, uh, we've got a wrap. Uh, anything else from the rack end side? That any last words of wisdom? Rob, Greg, Victor, you want to throw in before we wrap up? Uh, one, the one note I would have that, that I forgot to mention before is that some of the, the Kubernetes things we're demoing, they require you to be on tip because of some of the template magic that we're planning to talk about next meetup. Yeah, next meetup we're going to talk about the Sprig templating stuff, which adds a lot of uh, supercharged power to the already awesome Golang templating we're doing. Um, and what well, Rob is referring to is the Sprig templates have started to be sprinkled into the crib pattern. So that means you need to be on DRP endpoint uh, tip version along with the tip version of the content pieces uh, to get some of those uh, features. And those are going to trickle down to stable pretty soon. Yeah, I think Sprig made it into, into v, the V10 release. So v, you might be able to get away with V10. It, it, yes, it did. It made it into V10. So. So current stable DRP endpoint has the Sprig templating engine in it as well. Um, but I think we just added the feature flags, which is our RN tip, which helps us with the control aspects of that between the uh, web portal and the DRP endpoint side. Right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, looking forward to talking about Sprig next time. And then was that Greg just about to say something yeah. there? So hold off on tip for a few hours. Hold off on tip for a few hours. So if you're going to run out and deploy tip, wait. Yeah. Okay. So apparently we got a new fi new fix that needs to go into tip. So uh, go have lunch, uh, have a afternoon coffee or whatever is the case where you're at when you come back in a couple hours. Uh, the new version of tip. Uh, I think we're currently at tip 49, 310 tip 49. So you want to look for 50 and above at least, I think. Yeah, it'll probably be around 57 or 59. So. We're, at, we're at 
bumped that far already. All right, so somewhere in the deep in the 50s. <laughs> All um, right. I'll put something in community. We're, we're, we'll talk about this more next week when we talk about content specifically. There's, no, tip is broken right now. Tip is broken. There's nothing coming and, out of tip. Right and there's, there's, a, there's some things in tip in the, in the last couple of times where we're trying to make templating better, which we want to talk about as a unit. So we'll talk about Con content. Because yeah. there's, there's cool stuff that we're saving to talk about. Exactly. Uh, so next time on digital rebar provision, our focus will be on content and uh, templating and sprig and coolness around all of that stuff. I suspect we'll probably have some more interesting features for uh, the crib pattern as well that might creep in with the next uh, meetup as well. So until then, look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap on version 24 of Digital Rebar Provision Meetup. Thank you.